welcome everybody to Biblical Resources for the Feast of the Holy Trinity. This is a great feast and the mystery of course is profound. For this feast we have quite a short gospel which I've extended in order to give the context. And as usual, I'll use slides to guide us through the reading. So welcome again. As you can see, the verse numbers are 3, 19 to 15 and 16 to 18. The actual reading is 16 to 18, but I've extended it. And when I presentation is over, I hope you'll appreciate why I did that. So here's our plan of campaign, the current context, reading John 3, 9 to 18, the stories behind John 3, which take in Jacob, Abraham, Moses, and from Isaiah, the suffering servant, leading then to a reflection on salvation in the fourth gospel, and the way I've divided it up, Three events, healing, love, and service. Two interpretations, Passover and new creation, and one enactment through the Holy Spirit. Very brief commentary will follow. Then back to the message of the passage, the current context, and we'll close with a prayer. So the current context is all believers are facing questions which are not peripheral, not at the edge. How to speak of our experience of God today? What language can we find? How to speak of salvation today? From what are we saved? For what? And how? And how to speak of the Trinity in a sensible way? And what I hope to show at the end is that we must first of all experience God as Trinity and then perhaps the right words will come to us. So here is our extended reading. As you can see, we're in chapter three, and we take up in part of the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus replied, how can these things be? And Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? I tell you the solemn truth, we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you people about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So we're going to look at the stories behind that passage. And we begin with reference to Jacob, whose name was eventually changed to Israel, and as you can see from the text here, he is quite present unexpectedly in John 1 to 4. For instance, in John 151, we read, he continued, I tell all of you the solemn truth, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And then in the reading we just had, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. An obvious link back to John 1. 51. And then Jacob is mentioned, of course, in the story of the woman at the well. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, since he was tired out from the journey, sat right down beside the well. It was about noon. And the woman at the well asks a great question. Surely you are not greater than our ancestor Jacob, are you? Now, why Jacob at all? 
Well, Jacob is, of course, the ancestor of all the Israelites, the father of the 12 sons of Jacob, who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And in John's Gospel, Jacob's ladder is mentioned. Uh, it's an evocation of G Genesis 28, 10 to 17, where the story is told. And it's used to evoke the descent and ascent of the Son of Man. So incarnation and resurrection, actually. And Jacob's well is also mentioned, taken from Genesis 29, 1 to 4. And that's part of the marriage symbolism that we find so strongly present in John 2 to 4 and with a late echo in John chapter 19 at the burial of Jesus. The second figure who's behind these verses is the figure of Moses, important for everybody in the New Testament. And he's named explicitly, as you can see in chapters 1, 3, 5, 6, 9, 7 and 9. And for example, it begins very, very early. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. And then in our passage, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And later in the context of conflict, John 5, 45, the one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have placed your hope. And then, of course, Moses implied in the seven I am sentences, such as I am the bread of life, an echo of Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. Now, why Moses at all? Well, of course, Moses is the great teaching authority in Judaism, the great giver of the Torah, the law, the book of God's instruction. And there are three specific references that are important for John's gospel. First, there's an evocation of the burning bush. God gives the mysterious name, I am who I am, or I am who I will be, or I will be who I will be. This leads to a series of I am sentences in the fourth gospel, evoking the deep identity of Jesus in God. In uh, John chapter 6, there's reference to the gift of the manna, the heavenly bread, this is a reference to a story in Exodus 16, 4 to 36. And this sets up the picture of Jesus as the true manna, the true food for the journey from God, explored in John chapter 6. And Moses is also in a story, the he somewhat mysterious story, the healing in the desert with the bronze serpent. The full story should be read. It's in Numbers 21, 5 to 19, a somewhat mysterious story. But John's Gospel uses the lifting up of the bronze serpent as a fundamental metaphor for understanding salvation in Jesus, a healing or therapeutic metaphor. So very important for the whole Gospel because the language resonates throughout the Gospel. Abraham is named explicitly in chapter 8. You can see the various verses on the screen there. And he's implied in our reading because when it says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, there's an implied reference to the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. So then why Abraham? Well, Abraham is important for all the New Testament documents. He's the great father in faith, the distant father figure of the Israelite faith and later Judaism. And he underlines the discussion of Jesus' identity in John chapter 8. And then for our context, the one who was willing to give his only son. Abram was willing, but didn't have to go through with it. The story, terrifying story, in Genesis 22, 18, should also be read. And it is as a reference to that, of course, in God's soul of the world. But this time, God is willing to go through with the sacrifice. So it's the, it's the giving of Jesus for our salvation. Is what's implied in the reference to Abraham. So very important there. Now, perhaps the most surprising reference is the suffering servant figure from the prophet Isaiah. I'll explain later what the suffering servant is about, but here are the references in John's Gospel. The chosen one is taken from the suffering servants, John 1 34. We'll see it in a moment. To gather, very important image in John's Gospel mentioned in 1151, the light of the nations, so mentioned a couple of times, salvation, 
mentioned in John 3.16, and then the important language of lifted up in John 3.14 to 15. We'll go through each of these briefly to catch the resonance. The four suffering servant songs are from 2nd Isaiah 40 to 55, and the references are 42, 1 to 4, 49, 1 to 7, 54 to 11, and 52, 13 to 53, 12, the longest. These are familiar from the Holy Week readings, especially the fourth one, a very long reading, is read on Good Friday. And it is natural for us to think of Jesus when we hear these poems because the suffering servant was in the minds of all the gospel writers. The reference may go back to Jesus himself. Have a look at Mark 10, 48, if it's historical. And it's worth pausing on the suffering servant because of its special resonance in the fourth gospel, uniting the various aspects of salvation. So the image has tremendous potential, I think. In 2nd Isaiah 40 to 55, God's help to Israel expressed in three ways, creation, redemption, the vindication of the servant, and the return to Zion. Now our focus is on the servant. When you read the poems, it's hard to figure out if the servant is an individual, is it communal, or is it all of Israel? And it seems to be both. That's to say, it's an individual real prophet speaking, but speaking, or so to speak, suffering on behalf of all of Israel. And the servant did suffer the pain of exile like everybody else, but he went through the suffering in an exemplary way for the benefit of the community. It's important to make a nice distinction there. This for the benefit of the community is not substitutionary suffering, but exemplary suffering. So we may call it for the benefit of rather than instead of or in place of. And these Mysterious poems proved an especially rich resource for early Christian reflection on the cross. So we look quickly at the links with each song in the fourth gospel. So here's the first song part of it. Isaiah 41, 42, 1. Here is my servant whom I support, my chosen one, Eclectus, in whom I take pleasure. I have placed my spirit on him. He will make just decrees for the nations. Now, there's almost certainly a reference to that in one, John 1, uh, 34, where the text edited reads, I have both seen and testified, this is supposed to be John the Baptist speaking, that this man is the chosen one of God, eclectus. And that's reading chosen with many scholars. The text itself is actually disputed. The second song is Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. And we read just some verses of that. So in 49.3, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, to whom I will reveal my splendor. And in 49.5 and 6, so now the Lord God says, the one who formed me from birth to be his servant, he did so to restore Sunago, Jacob, to himself, so that Israel might be gathered, Sunago, to himself. And I will be honored in the Lord's sight, but my God is my source of strength. He says, is it too insignificant a task for you to be my servant, to reestablish the tribes of Jacob and restore the remnant of Israel? I will make you a light force to the nations so that you can bring my deliverance, Soteria, to the remote regions of the earth. And the references in the fourth gospel, which pick up this language, are 11, John eleven fifty one, a, quote, a reference to uh, the high priest speaking. Now, he did not say this on his own behalf, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the Jewish nation and not for the Jewish nation only, but to gather together, sunago, into one, the children of God who are scattered. And in the story of the woman at the well, we read John four twenty two: you people worship what you do not know, we worship what we know because salvation, soteria, is from the Jews. And then, of course, in the lead up to the story of the man born blind, there are two references to Jesus as the light of the world. Not the light of the nations, but the light of the world. Third song is Isaiah 54 to 11, 
we pay attention just to one part of that. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys his servant? Whoever walks in deep darkness without light should trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Now, it's evident enough that the language of light and darkness is common in religions and, of course, common in John's Gospel. So all the references are there at the top for the use of light. Any example will do. Here's John 12, 46. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. More or less a clear reference to Isaiah 50, 10. Further out uh, in Isaiah 12, 35, we read, the light is with you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness may not overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. And so the language of walking in darkness and light also evoked and certainly part of the language of John's Gospel taken from Isaiah 54 to 11. Now the most extensive song is the fourth one, which is 52, 13 to 53, 12. Again, we just look at part of it. So I'll read a couple of verses. So John 52, 13. Look, my servant will succeed. He will be elevated, lifted high. And they have the verb hupso'o, to lift, to lift up and greatly exalted. In 53.11, <clears throat> having suffered, he will reflect on his work. He will be satisfied when he understands what he has done. My servant will acquit many, for he carried their sins. And in 53.1, who would have believed what we just heard when was the Lord's power, literally the arm, revealed through him? Now the references to the lifting up are the key references. And you can see there the language is found in John chapter 1, 3, 5, 8, 11, and 12. It's part, very much part of what, what our reading is. So John 3, 14, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And this is a therapeutic lifting up, so part of salvation. Power revealed can be found in several parts of John's Gospel. The most significant reference for us is John 12, 37. Although Jesus had performed so many miraculous signs before them, they still refused to believe in him. So the word the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled. He said, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? A clear reference to, to Isaiah 53, 1. So I think it's evident enough that the Suffering Servant songs permeate the presentation of Jesus in the fourth gospel in a perhaps unexpected way. Here are all the lifting up sayings to John 3, 14 that we've seen a few times. John 8, 28, and Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, the name of God. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but speak just what the Father taught me. And then very important in John 12, 32. And I, when I am lifted up from it, will draw all people to myself. This is the gathering in image. And John 12, 34. Then the crowd responded, we have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And that language of lifting up, comes from two places. It comes from Moses lifting up the serpent in the desert, and it comes from the fourth suffering servant song, my servant will be lifted high, with the Greek verb, hoops all. So, uh, John's Gospel uses three fundamental metaphors for salvation. It would take longer to explore all of these, but here goes. There's the healing metaphor, the lifting up taken from Moses. There's the servant metaphor, metaphor taken from the washing of the feet evoking of course the suffering servant and of course there is the language of love god so loved the world and god's love is disclosed in inverted commas the service of the cross in my opinion the traditional language of the suffering servant permeates all three metaphors so the suffering servant is the key to all of them because he's behind the lifting up and the healing, obviously in the service, and the whole thing is done on behalf of, benefit of, the gathering of the people of God. In synthesis, we may map salvation in the fourth gospel in the following way. Now this is much too brief, 
but perhaps it'll work for the moment. Here's my own verbalization of what happened for us in Jesus' death and resurrection according to the fourth gospel. The creator God has healed humanity of death by sending his son in an act of self-emptying and loving service, setting us free from the power of death and sin. And God's loving therapy is a new Passover and a new creation enacted in us by the Holy Spirit. That's an attempt to put in a, a compact form the teaching of the whole of the fourth gospel. And then looked at more broadly, I think it looks something like this. The saving events are presented using three lenses in the fourth gospel. That is healing, love and service, as we have seen. In the fourth gospel, the writer wants to talk about the significance of these events for two groups, for the Jews and for all of humanity. And for the Jewish reception of these events, he presents them in Passover language, which is present really strongly throughout this gospel from the very beginning to the very, very end. And then for all of humanity, so broadening the audience, he speaks of new creation, evoking the book of Genesis, and the language continues from the, very, from the first chapter and is evoked especially in John chapter 19, the death of Jesus, and in John chapter 20, the resurrection. So the writer is saying that the events of salvation, the healing, the love, and the service are of you know, life-giving significance for Jews in the lens of Passover and for all of humanity in the lens of a new creation. And finally, the gospel writer believes that these events of salvation are made real in the lives and hearts of believers through the activity of the Holy Spirit. And my own verbalization is salvation is enacted in believers' lives and hearts through the gift and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I know that's much too brief, but it gives a kind of picture of what's going on in the fourth gospel and I think speaks to us powerfully today. The commentary needn't be long because all the spade work has been done. So I just have two pages. So John 3.16, for this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So behind this is of course the story of Abraham and the key words are loved, gave and believe. I suppose only son is also extremely important. Eternal life in the fourth gospel um, is about life now. And if I were to put it bluntly, you don't have to be dead to enjoy it. It means a quality of life, an authenticity of life, which we have now in Christ, which in the language of the letter to the Hebrews gives us an indestructible life, which not even the bar of death can destroy. Later in the gospel, we get sentences like, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And there are lots of references like that across the gospel that you can look up at your leisure. My second comment is on verses 17 to 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. And the one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So verse uh, 17 captures the deeply positive purpose of God, behind which then, of course, stands the image of Abraham and the near sacrifice of Isaac. Generally, we're happy with that, and we're happy with 18a, the first part of it. The second part creates problems for us because we live in a different world. Perhaps this comment might help, these are the people who once believed and then consciously and therefore culpably rejected life in Christ. This was a feature of the community of the fourth gospel. Some people actually walked away, as can be seen from the first letter and also from the very last part of John chapter 6. It doesn't mean just anyone without faith, because that would be a general condemnation of an awful lot of people. But the fourth gospel thinks those who consciously and culpably walked away from the reality of Christ, that they are under judgment. That's also problematic for us, but that's what the writer is saying. So, 
John 3, 16 to 18, which is our brief reading for the Feast of the Holy Trinity, can it be read in isolation? Which it kind of often is, of course, because John 3, 16 is quoted frequently. But it must be read in the overall context of John 3, which starts with Nicodemus and ends up with John the Baptist. And then in its nearer context, must be read in light of Jacob, Moses, Abraham, and the suffering servant from Isaiah. And this offers a very compact summary of salvation in this gospel. To summarize it again, in Jesus lifting up, the love of the Father is disclosed. A big teaching of this gospel. In Jesus' loving service, he really means the crucifixion and resurrection. The love of the Son becomes a reality for us. And in Jesus' gift of the Advocate, the love of Father and Son is enacted in the hearts of all believers. In this way, although the reading does not mention the Holy Spirit, it is very suitable for the feast read in the wide context of salvation in the fourth gospel. Of course, the Trinity is unfathomable. Of course, we struggle to find words. Nevertheless, at the center is an experience, that is, the experience of the breathtaking love of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And to conclude, the doctrine of the Trinity is not, first of all, a puzzle, which in principle could be solved, you know, a mental puzzle that we might take on, but a mystery, that is, a relationship which is, first of all, lived, never exhausted, and only inadequately spoken of, in words. This is true of all our significant relationships and all the more so of our relationship with God. So within that, within the mystery of this relationship, we recognize God the Father from whom we come, in whom we live and move and have our being, to use the words on the lips of St. Paul in Acts 17. We recognize the Son, the way, the truth and the life as the fourth gospel teaches. And we recognize the Spirit dwelling within us, enacting the great events that give us new life in Christ. So go back to our current context and questions which are not peripheral. Perhaps with these reflections, we can begin to speak of our experience of God today. And perhaps we might find a new language of salvation, service, love, and healing. And perhaps we might also manage to speak of the Trinity in a meaningful way, first of all to ourselves and then to others who may ask us. And so we pray. Merciful and gracious Father, you showed the fullness of your love when you gave your only Son for our salvation and sent down upon us the power of your Spirit. Complete within us, the work of your love, that we who have communion in Christ may come to share fully the undying life he lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. This brings us to the end of the presentation, so I'll close down the slides. So thank you very much for taking part in this lecture. I hope the exploration of John's Gospel has not been too much and that uh, the text will speak richly to us in the liturgy when we hear it on the Feast of Trinity Sunday. God bless everyone and thanks very much.